Billy Nay Ken Lagon, the founder of Home Depot, issued a warning to Pope Francis during an interview with CNBC, which was published Monday. The interview, he said that wealthy people such as himself are feeling ostracized by the Pope's message in support of the poor and might stop giving to charity if the Pope continues to make statements criticizing capitalism and income inequality. The guy described the Pope's comments about a, quote, culture of prosperity as exclu- as exclusionary statements that may make some of the rich, quote, incapable of feeling compassion for the poor. <laughs> wow. That guy's a... F- oh, go figure. He's a major donor for the Republican Party. Who? What's his name? Uh, Ken Lagon. Founder of Home Depot. Oh. Oh, man. I do shop a lot at Home Depot. Maybe I'll have to... The other, the only problem is the main competition for Home Depot here is Menards, who I believe are also big Republican Party contributors. Well, yeah, they're from Wisconsin. Well, that doesn't necessarily make you... They're from Eau Claire. Well, you know that. They're from Eau Claire, so... Yeah, yep. Well, the Eau only Claire... place in the world that has two Menards. <laughs> Eau Claire has... Uh, um, their representative is Ron Kind, right? Yeah. You know what topic I'd like to do? I would like to talk about other podcasts and their uh, comments about economic theory. I love that idea. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so in in preparation for this podcast, Tony and I listened to a bunch of other podcasts, and also just, I don't know, because we enjoy listening to them. Um, But we notice, obviously, as Marxists, we notice when another podcast brings up anything that even touches a little bit on economic theory or social theory or or something that Marxism may have something to say about. And, I don't know, this episode might be, it's a reaction or an analysis or maybe just a rant on on those things that that we find in in other productions. I like the idea of just rolling them all into one. It's a reaction analysis rant. Yeah should be a single word. There should be a good word for that. If well, we knew German, <laughs> there's probably a German word for that, or we could make one that sounds... Yeah, that sounds intimidating. Yeah. yeah. There's got to be one. Anyway. Yeah, I don't know. Primarily for this, the ones that I listen to that stand out the most are... Or that this pops up in is the Cracked Podcast and Hello Internet, which yeah. are also the two that I listen to the most and most regularly yeah let's let's talk about each of those to start with i think that'd be a great place to start so one that i want to talk about is the in the hello internet podcast which is if you happen to watch youtube it's uh cpg gray's channel uh or his podcast along with the guy that does number file Number so, file, periodic videos. And a bunch of others. Like 20 different channels. Brady Heron. Okay, yep. Do you know what Gray's name is? Did they say his name? As far as I know, it's CPG Gray. And he looks like a stick figure is, is all I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, but, I don't yeah, I assume that's his name. And if you don't know CPG Gray, he did a video where he talks very fast, like a lot of folks in vlogs. Um, he talks very fast explaining the difference between Great Britain, United Kingdom, and Ireland or something. Like, that's his most popular one, isn't it? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, where he's breaking down the UK. So, basically just, you know, YouTubers, people that honestly make a living just making content and putting it on YouTube or the internet in one way or another. Um, and there's one episode of their podcast, which is called Hello Internet... Uh, where Gray talks about his former role as a teacher and what it was like. And this is very interesting to me because the entire conversation revolves around his critique of education as a system. 
and Brady uh, is a kind of egging him on. You know, he's playing the role that he always plays, which is just kind of to sit back, ask questions, and egg Gray on a little bit. But the the funny thing is what the way that their audience reacts to it, and also I think the way that Brady kind of introduces his reaction to it is the the idea of whether or not teachers are good people. It's like, why does it keep coming back to that? Like, everything he says, actually, it's a lot of the similar stuff that I mentioned because I used to be a teacher in one of our earlier recordings. Um, we, we did uh, a little get-to-know red section, and I talked about my my problems being, you know, my struggles being an educator. And, you know, the way I an- analyzed it, if you remember to that episode, or maybe I don't know what order we'll release <laughs> these in, but if you, if you when when you get to that episode, I call it, I say that battle, that education is a battleground for class conflict because there are these wonderful things about education that, you know, socialists would support and, and I do support as a socialist and think that it's vitally important. You know, basically being an informed citizen, thinking critically, being able to question the world around you, all extremely important things for anyone that wants to change the world for the better. But then there's also these other incentives that are basically teach children to show up on time when the bell rings and to listen to your teacher and don't question what they say. Just find out what they want and do it quickly and and all of those kind of things, which are basically preparing you to be a good servant for your future corporate overlord, right? Uh, So... The, that's that's the basic division there. And Gray basically says the same things. He doesn't use the same words that I use, but he has a critique of the fact that grades are largely used to categorize students into different categories and that they're largely already in those categories when they show up to school based upon their social upbringing, what class they were raised in, and and that school basically just legitimizes and solidifies those distinctions. And, and, and you know, a whole bunch of really solid critique of education as a system but what does what does everyone pick up on? They say, "Oh, you're bashing teachers because teachers, you know, it's it's the question, but teachers do good, don't they? Or they try really hard." It's like nothing that he said was a critique of what teachers do. Yeah. That which is interesting to me. That's like he critiqued that, himself a bit, but I don't he didn't critique teachers in general or in that, if ye- I remember. Yeah, exactly. But that's like how everyone interpreted what he said was you're complaining about education, so you must be complaining about teachers. Which is very interesting to me. Like that th- it it shows a lack of of thinking in the style where you critique a system rather than the participants in that system. And and I think that and, the, and maybe just as like a marxist or a socialist I'm used to doing that or maybe because he didn't introduce his analysis sp- explicitly as a critique of education as a system that no one thought to interpret it that way. But that's essentially what he does. Yeah, I well, yeah, he doesn't use the word system, but I feel like he might even say his thoughts on education, which to me would imply a system. But I think it's interesting, the part that stands out most to me about all of what he was saying, because, yeah, I also, I thought that, that was interesting, his thoughts on that, because I don't, ha- I mean, I have some personal experience from being a student, but... I don't have any experience from an educator standpoint. I hang out with a lot of educators, so I know it's tough, but that's, that's about all I know of that. But what stood out to me was the parts where he's talking about uh, like foreign language, where that foreign language wasn't a valuable skill to have. That's the part that stood out where he's talking about what's valuable for making money in the future. Mm. Oh, yeah. That yeah. part really stood out to me. Yeah. Oh, that. Really interesting. Which, you know, maybe, I I don't know. I I think there is a critique. Like, clearly he was also falling into this trap of of this basic mindset about education that certain people believe 
and many people believe this to a to even a small extent you know there's different extents but the basic idea is that education is there to prepare you so that you can make money in this new economy or or in whatever economy and and in many ways it is right like all of those things that i mentioned about f- showing up on time when the bell rings fi- figuring out what your teacher wants of you and doing that thing without you know asking too many questions or whatever those are all skills that are really helpful if you want to have a good job right like if you can't show up on time that's a problem and and school does that but large you know is that training you to be a good citizen or just be a good worker to make a lot of money for someone else. Yeah. And I think it's interesting with jobs, they explicitly spell out educational requirements too. You know, it's not like a, oh, well, we'd prefer this. It's you must have, for, I mean, not every job, but most every job, especially these days, says you must have, you know, a be enrolled in high school or have a high school diploma or you have to have a bachelor's degree mm-hmm. and even in specific trainings based upon you know their specific accredited like oh yeah business is really especially at the higher education has really sharpened that as their own tool i i think the the institution that's most supposed to be for really broadening people's minds and horizons and making them really think is really a huge, huge factory for businesses. Oh, yeah. And not just in terms of workers, but in terms of research as well. Like the directed directed research at universities that then private corporations can purchase because they influence the politicians, to influence, you know, the deans to have them. It's just, it's mm-hmm. insane. Yep. Sorry, that was my but, tangent. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. But the, but I think the thing that irks me the most about it is someone like, you know, someone can put out this this, um, you know, analysis or critique without realizing essentially what they're, you know, the problems that that Gray identifies, which you know are sorting kids into, you know substructure you know these are the college bound kids these are not the college bound kids blah 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 you know basically doing that kind of thing or or you know making kids do these things which may not be of large educational value but that prepare them for what they're going to have to get used to for their future those kind of things all makes sense if you come at it from a marxist point of view if you have a marxist critique you know otherwise it just seems like this irrational system that you don't know why it's bad but it's bad or you think it's bad just because of tradition or it's been that way or whatever but it's like well why you know it's not like schools have always been that way we have not always had k-12 through education like there's a whole history there and, you know, a lot of school, I think we mentioned this in the other episode, is based on the old factory system. Like, that's literally why there are bells that ring. It's like the whistle that blows where you got to be on the assembly line to put things together. Yeah. And um, a lot of the old schools, like I'm thinking mid-1800s, were established because of kids working in the factories that they thought it was an issue. Like, um, I want to say it's Engels's conditions of the working class in 1844 where he talks about the education level of these kids and i believe the amount of education they needed that or that was compulsory was like an hour a day or something like that but i mean you know talking to kids who had taken a dozen years of an often religious education like just coal mining kids they couldn't say who jesus was and like, uh, like the english kids thought he was just somebody from brighton and you know <laughs> like they thought the garden of eden was you know like all sorts of basic questions they couldn't answer because they were too tired from that so uh yeah yeah it's it's very much and i know that that was not the intent was to make them or i don't think the original reforms to get the schools from that was to make them better workers but i think that was quickly appropriated Oh, yeah. By the capitalists who often ran the schools. Yeah, like so many things are political decisions, especially in in any place that has a certain degree of democracy. They need to have that dual character where it sounds good enough that people will support it and vote for it or vote for a politician that argues for it. 
Um, but then the trick is for the ruling class to then appropriate that in a way that people won't necessarily entirely reject. Yeah. yeah. You do something that sounds really, really nice, and then you, you just slip your own little thing in there. Yep. So I think, so my first critique is basically that from time to time, problems will come up. Someone will complain about something in a uh, in popular podcast like CPG Grey. And let's, what, what do they complain about in Cracked that's similar? Like they had a whole episode about um, how uh, famous people don't get actually famous on their own. It's actually like a, a whole bunch of circumstances and, uh, you know, a lot of support either th- via a, a government support or th- via... Um, rich individuals, rich sponsors that that basically bail these people out time and time again until they're able to strike it big. Like Henry Ford. Yeah. I know they use that example. Yeah. And so you get that exact same critique, but not from a Marxist understanding, even though it fits perfectly in that. It just feel What you walk away with is, oh yeah, it's like this weird thing that we just, like, psychologically want it to be that way rather than there being like a social structure around why we worship like the the rugged individual who does it on his own because if we have that story that justifies that a large concentration of wealth versus you know a more equitable distribution if they did it all on their own without anyone's help well can you really you know, blame them for keeping all of that. Whereas if they didn't really do it on their own and actually a lot of people helped along the way, then it becomes more questionable whether or not it makes sense for that person to have so much wealth while other people are suffering. Yeah, and I also think, I mean, that fits really well in neo, the individ, rugged individual, I think fits perfectly with neoclassical uh, economic theory that the it's the people who put the effort and time into being rich and successful are rich and successful and if you're poor it's your own circumstance and Mm -hmm. that's a very economic thing with the opportunity cost i believe is how they normally express it i I think that's how my high school economics expressed it you have an opportunity cost to work or go to school which is nonsense to a large degree for a lot of people because there isn't really an option but you know Mm -hmm. Just something so simple like that that people don't think about, but then, yeah, they just build it into, oh, well, this is how we're psychologically wired as humans, as opposed to this is how we're psychologically wired by society. Um, yeah. w- w- one, of the f- one of the most enjoyable parts about understanding neoclassical economic theory is that when you realize there is no prescriptive piece of neoclassical economic theory basically i mean unless you count this this is basically you know what should happen if you ever ask the question what should it be the answer is whatever the market decides so if if for some reason based on the rules of the market whatever we decide those to be that's you know one person can totally rip off another person or can you know become extremely wealthy while other people starve that's what it should be you know they're What's, you know, the answer, what should the minimum wage be? Well, the answer is whatever anyone is willing to possibly work for. But, but, you know, yeah, there's lots of counterexamples that we don't need to get into. Or maybe not counterexamples, but examples that show that that kind of thinking really falls flat. You know, you know. What's scary is the people who take the hard line, like uh, the economist Hayek. Mm. can't remember what his first name is anymore but you know he he thinks it was a mistake that for the great depression that they bailed anyone out they think that that you know letting people starve to death and that's the part that they always gloss over with any of the really (laughs) hard line yeah uh free trade hands off the market is that people will die if you just let the market sort things out Mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons that it's not thoroughly tested because nobody's willing to just let people die because instead of having a free market you're going to have an insurrection yeah right if you let if you know if they let twenty thousand people starve to death during the great depression we might have a communist country right now yeah things things would 
undoubtedly be very different right now if <laughs> yeah. for for you know one way or another but yeah although that'd be interesting communist the united states having a communist revolution not long after the russian revolution mm-hmm. hmm. yeah i'd really screw with world history <laughs> yes. if anybody wants to write a historical fiction novel there's your premise <laughs> yeah i'm sure it's been done but it, that, if anyone knows of one you should tweet us or leave a comment on our blog. Yeah. Because that I, would be fun to read. Yeah, that'd be awesome to read. Um, so. so another thing with... Uh, let, let's also talk about this, because I think um, th- this is the other part. So they'll, the popular podcast will introduce a critique that is essentially a Marxist critique or would fit very neatly in a, within a Marxist critique. You know, the thing they complain about and all of the details of it point to basically a critique of capitalism as a system and how capitalism works. However, they never draw the lines between it. They just, it it's always seems like the problem is just this isolated problem that's just really weird and we don't really know where it came from or why except for maybe because people just decided not to change what they're doing or something. I think a non, a good non-podcast example of that is Michael Moore's documentary, um, Capitalism, A Love Story. Mm-hmm. He clearly identifies capitalism as the problem, but oh, well, I guess this isn't exactly right, because his critique isn't necessarily a critique of capitalism as such. It's a critique of some of the symptoms of capitalism Yeah, and describing that fixing these weird things that happen in capitalism will ultimately... He doesn't say overthrow capitalism, but that's his implication. But it's it's that sort of fumbling around the problem without without letting yourself fully understand and embrace the solution. Yep. yep. Is I think the problem. And Michael Moore, I think that's probably very conscious because he gets uh, red baited a lot. Mm-hmm. I assume so. But yeah, to to produce the movie called Capitalism: A Love Story. And then to only complain about the worst parts of capitalism. I mean, that's essentially what he does is say, oh, these people got thrown out of their home and these people couldn't get any health care or whatever. I forget what all of them are. One but of the, like, One of them was companies taking out secret life insurance policies against terminally ill patients. Oh, man. Yeah. That, that like, is rough. So... I mean, to to make a movie about capitalism and then only point to the worst parts of capitalism is, I mean, it probably frustrated pro-capitalists as well, saying you only showed the bad parts. But it frustrated me as a Marxist because it was like, you didn't tie this in with the normal functioning of capitalism. Like, what you should show in this movie is, here are these awful things, but here here is why they are just the logical extension of the basic contradictions of capital and which is a very marxist way to say it but you could i don't know you wouldn't necessarily have to use the marxist jargon but you could say this is why you know this is how capitalism functions quickly explain like basic surplus value and exploitation and then say and because of the drive to accumulate surplus value, here are all these extra awful things that capitalism does. Yeah. I feel like a lot of progressive documentaries fall into that trap, though. Of and the only other ones popping in my head is the I can't remember the healthcare one. Michael Moore also did sicko. Yeah, sicko. Where his argument isn't that. I mean, it's that we should have universal health care, and then basically culminates with saying, "Well, prisoners get it." <laughs> which is you know okay it's yeah it's yeah i think that that's a trap that I'll, i i guess we could just say progressive media in general falls into mm-hmm. and here i found the name of the ep- one of the episodes of the cracked one oh good that i i think we really need to talk about and that is episode 12 millennial panic Oh, where, yeah. Where oh, they're man. talking about sort of what we touched on a little bit with the student debt. Um, but, I mean, in that same issue, but with people not working and not caring about it. And my, I think it was that episode. I'd have to listen to it again to be sure. But 
I think they do this a couple times. They spend a lot of time criticizing capitalism. Like, they specifically point out the massive gains in productivity versus how, you know, when I think Jason Pargin says that when he was younger, they were told that you would only work like a four-hour day because productivity is going up so much. Yep, yep. But my my part that boggles my mind is they go through all this and they go, well, but, you know, I like capitalism. Capitalism's good. Yeah. They spend the entire yeah. time critiquing it, and then they go, oh, but, you know, it, it's fine, except for every fundamental reason we just showed you why it isn't fine. Yeah, basically talking about how... We've we've automated so much. I mean, they get all like this close to saying we have reached a post scarcity society where work can be largely reduced and we can have a, a large amount of leisure time for people to you know whatever enrich themselves. Blah blah blah. You know, almost they get almost are hitting on this kind of stuff that Marxists were critiqued about for being far too utopian. You know, like the dream of of laying around and painting in the morning and doing a little hunting in the afternoon or whatever, or fishing, I think, is actually in, like, one of Marx's yeah. quotes. Like, one of those very short snippets about what communist society might look like and philosophizing in a different time. But, but yeah, like, basically having a lo- large amounts of time for basically just self-improvement, enrichment, hobbies, that kind of stuff. Uh, and they get very close to basically saying that i mean that's kind of like the point of the whole episode is that we've automated so much stuff that there's not a lot of work left to do but we have an economy that doesn't really recognize that and punishes people for not working and we have to come up with you know ways to essentially keep people busy just so we can feel okay giving them a paycheck yeah uh which i think i think that is sort of happening, but I'm not going to take as an extreme stance. Like, I think yeah. there's probably actually still a lot of work that needs to be done, but does everyone need to work 40 hours a week? Probably not. I think more what it is is there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but that's not the work that businesses are doing. Yeah, that's, like, that's another thing. The infrastructure in this country is terrifyingly bad, mm-hmm. but... Despite all the road construction, you know, I see outside, that's just pretty standard. It's not really addressing that problem, or it is on a very slow scale. Mm-hmm. It's. I, I feel like the jobs are... I think they mentioned, like, Walmart greeter. Oh. And st- you know, mm-hmm. um, like, instead of just giving old people enough money to retire on and say, you know, just retire, you know, you don't have to do it. It's, oh, well, why don't you hand people carts and say, hey when they come into Walmart, you know. <laughs> yep. Or I think crossing guards can fill in. Although I would say that they actually perform a pretty yeah. an important role as I saw a cross guard a couple months ago stop a little kid from getting screamed by a car blowing a red light right by my house. <laughs> yep. And I think cars are probably actually more likely to stop if there's a cross guard telling them to stop too. Yeah. But yeah, there's I mean there's just tons of things that we can automate or will soon automate. I mean Computers are replacing people all the time. Like, especially, this actually gets into CPG Gray's, one of his more recent videos that you sent me the link for. We'll get the name for that, too. Uh, Pit of Doom. Pit of Doom is the Pit name? Of Doom. How dramatic. Yeah. Yeah, we wouldn't even put out something that dramatic, I don't think. Yeah. But, no, yeah, which is all about automation and how... Uh, computers are replacing people all the time. The big one coming up soon being self-driving cars. There's a lot of industry. I mean, there's taxis and transport, you know, the whole truckers and everything. There's a lot of people that make their living driving cars. And if cars can drive themselves, that's going to put all those people out of work. Which in a logical socialist society would mean more leisure time because there's less work for everyone to do, and but the still all the stuff is getting done. Yeah. But is in our world actually going to mean a bunch of people are put out of work and they are now looking for a new job and driving down the cost of labor because of it? So everyone will, you know, the working class will largely make less money because of that change, especially because those are like good unionized jobs, a lot of them. Yeah. Although I also think it's the we should mention too that the long talk that they have about that is in response to a video he put up 
all about the automation. Oh, I believe yeah. believe it's called Humans Need Not Apply. Oh, that's the, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's, that's the, the video. video. Yeah, and watch Pitt, the video version. Watch the, well, I think watch the video, then listen to the, his discussion about it. And I think it's interesting in his, him and Brady's discussion where he won says he doesn't have answers and isn't going to give answers yep. which and i think is in int- the video doesn't either yeah. yeah yeah which he says is very purposeful um but what i also like is that he very he says i am not a socialist yep like that is but he's taking but his whole argument about it is worrying about the social responsibility he says I don't think a society can exist. It's not a society if you do not take care of the members of that society or something to that effect, which is Mm -hmm. the social question, which is what socialism is supposed to answer. Yeah. It's very interesting to me that a a internet personality or a podcast host or a YouTuber or whatever, you know, Gray is all of these things, um, it's very interesting to me that they feel the need so strongly to say, I am not a socialist. But look at the argument you're making. The argument you're making is that we have technologically outgrown capitalism. So at, at, your, at the very least, maybe you're not a socialist, but at the very least, you're an anti-capitalist, which already puts you in a, a particular political camp. And I don't think that that's something to necessarily be ashamed of or to hide or, or any of those things. You know, the, the idea that you would hide that because then people might not listen to you is... You know, the, the, you the, they made a parallel later. Gray and Brady, I, I guess mostly Gray, made a parallel with his bringing people to think about this in the same way that people that uh, the the gay and lesbian community was able to address gay rights. Well, the you know the gay and lesbian community would not have made very many gains if they had decided let's not tell anyone that we are gay or lesbian. You know, let's just. The, the, get them to think about something for for a little bit of time that's you know it's not an effective strategy you have to, the sure it may undermine your message for a, a small amount of time or for particularly just you if you're the only one doing it but if many people come out if people look at this issue and come to the logical conclusion as you have that and even if they don't articulate it because the cpg grade does not articulate it but it you know there's it's very hard to read his conclusion without reading it as a dismissal of how capitalism works and and the need for an alternate system. Now, maybe he's not comfortable calling that system socialism or, or even it naming the system at all, but the fact that he's identified it a problem inherent in capitalism, I think, is undeniable. And to say, to hide the fact that that's what it is, a problem with capitalism, I think just allows the issue to fester further. It, and without naming the problem, without getting to the core of it, you're, you're letting it continue further. So I would, I would urge Gray and, and others, you know, to, to recognize a critique of capitalism for what it is and and to be brave enough to say that you support an alternative or at the very least a discussion about what the alternatives could be because that's something that people don't ask for now and and that's a real travesty that that we can't even have a discussion about what what could be better or what um or what really is wrong. I mean, his main point of it was that we need to uh, de... I can't think of words today. Uh, De-stereotype? No. I don't know. Make it so that it doesn't seem so bad uh, that somebody does unemployed. Oh, Destigmatize. Yeah, de- uh-huh. There we go. Yes. Well, <laughs> I, I think even more so than that, I, uh, actually, I, I want to make a comment that um, this is something that Marxists have debated for a long time. Like, the, the basic theory of his video, it starts out with, um, 
with the idea that we used to have a lot of horses to get from one place to another, and now we really don't need very many horses. And so he draws a parallel between that and humans, saying we used to have to have humans do all this work. And and he has a lot of good documentation about how it's not just manual labor or like like driving or whatever there will be robots that can diagnose patients and do the work of doctors and other professionals robots that can do the bulk of legal work and so you won't need as many lawyers to to dig through all of the previous documentation because you know a, a software program can search it more quickly and become more sophisticated and understand it better you know blah 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 you, you get to the point where you know no profession is safe from automation, which is something I completely agree with. But this is the question that I think is the interesting one. Gray assumes that that means that there will be a point where no humans need to do any work, which may be true. I don't know. I actually don't have an answer to this, but he, he seems to have arrived at that answer. My question is, the, the way that it couldn't be true, or the way that it may not be true, is that we may just invent more things that need to be done, right? Because like, the example is that we used to have to have 90% of the people producing our food for us, and only 10% didn't. Well, that's no longer the case. And then we had like large numbers of people doing manufacturing, so we would have the stuff, uh, you know, cars and houses and blah, blah, blah. Well, now hardly very many people do manufacturing because we've automated it. So we've automated food and manufacture and, you know, many textiles can be automated, although labor is so cheap in the third world, they often aren't automated. But those could be automated too. But with every every time we've automated an industry, it has thrown people out of work. It's made people be unemployed and lose their livelihood and suffer awful things. But at the same time, we've also always invented new areas. So I am not necessarily convinced that capitalism will implode via automa- automation. It'll be like George Jetson. I, uh, a couple weeks ago, ended up sitting in the same room that the Jetsons movie was on in. That for real? Was, my, my mom put it on for uh, my son and nephew to watch. And boy, looking at that movie as a critique of capitalism is very, very easy because it starts out uh, with they have to raise their house and it's in like smoggy crap mm. and they have to raise it into the sky. But he has to go, you know, to his factory on an asteroid where there's all this precious resource to make. And this is something that always boggles my mind. Cogs. They have flying cars. But, they need to but cogs. seemingly their main industry is cog making? I, I don't understand at all. <laughs> or sprockets, excuse me. They're sprockets. Um, although I think that's a brand name since it's basically sprocket. But anyway, his only job he has to do... He's like the only one who works there than a maintenance robot. He just hits one button. Yeah. That's his whole job is to hit the button. Yep. Um, I won't go into all of the uh, exploiting natural resources and uh, yeah. with the Inclu- indigenous people, indigenous creatures there, and then later having them exploit their own resources and giving the... Uh, it's, it's very... Cl- there's, there could very easily be a critique of capitalism and colonialism uh-huh. in that movie. Yeah. But... You know, that's what that makes me think of is the, you know, just creating jobs. It's the George Jetson just there to push a button. And not only there to push a button, but that pushing the button pays for housing. Uh, He's the only one who works in his family. They have a robot nanny who, presuming they don't have robot slaves since the robots are sentient and he works with robots, some robot people. Uh Presuming then that he also pays her a wage. That's not clear, necessarily. No, it's not that, clear. It could, very it well could be also be a slave slide society. <sighs> Which would be, I guess, yeah. But, yeah. The the Jetsons, they... I might have to read up on the creators of the Jetsons to see if that was just an in- unintentional thing. Yeah. Or not. But, the, I mean, the... I mean, that's how we've sustained the 40-hour work week ever since it was established long ago. When the... 
early 19th century, late 18th century, or, or not, night. Uh, sorry, I'm off by those. I mean, early 1900s, late 1800s. Yeah. Um, I forget when it was. I know? couldn't, I couldn't give you a year, but, no. I'm terrible with years. But, uh, but a long time. I mean, there was a long history of the working day being reduced from 16 hours to 14 to four, you know, down to, uh, 12 and then down to 10 and then down to eight. And then it's kind of stopped at eight. Yeah. And the, and you know, what have we done to main, maintain that number of working hours? We've just created more industry. You know, there's people that do a bunch of stuff now, you know, even though we don't have people work that many people working in food production or manufacture, we have a lot more service in industry. We've got high tech stuff, I've guess, you know, we've got, probably more people working in education now i'm not really sure with all the cuts it's hard to, to say or no but the but we've always come up with more stuff for people to do and so i even though i like to critique capitalism and i think a lot of marxists would be happy to hear that capitalism will implode on itself because of its ability to automate workplaces I am not sure that it will. Yeah, I you know, I could I can see it both ways. If capitalism fails to put up a adequate number of jobs or uh have some sort of social program in place to keep people from starving to death, I think yeah, it will implode. But I think that capitalism is unfortunately far too adaptive in response very quickly to things like that in general. See, this is the one thing that I think is, maybe maybe I'm boiling this down the wrong way, but at the moment, this is my biggest question. I think this will be the deciding factor. Is it true that now, with our current ability to revolutionize technology, are we going to automate jobs faster than we can invent new ones? Because that might be the difference. We've always been able to invent new jobs when when uh, people become unemployed because of automation. But are we now going to get to the point where we are able to automate jobs faster than we can create new ones? It could be. I mean, like, if you look at the job I do, it's, I mean, you could eliminate probably... Uh, Anybody who makes decisions about this who's above me, listen, stop listening. You could probably eliminate half of the jobs because we have four places at our library where you can check yourself out. Mm-hmm. We have a machine that checks out and then organizes books as to where they, and other materials where they need to go in the library. So there's already a large bit of automation there. The only thing that you absolutely need a person for is, like, taking fine payments and... What else? Taking fine payments and giving people new library cards, which could both very easily be automated. Oh, man, yeah, like a little credit card swiper? Yep. Done. Yep. I mean, thankfully, it's a city uh, public position, so... Presumably, they wouldn't go that route, hopefully. Dude, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I don't think anything's necessarily safe. No, but yeah, and like, even for the people who put away books, there are machines that exist now that will put books away in order for you. Mm. The uh, Well, I mean, the other thing is, I think Amazon does this, where their warehouses, they have a, a bot that goes and gets of like the shelf that you need, like they're little tiny shelves, yeah. and you have to pick the thing off the shelf. But then that person doesn't need to walk around a warehouse. They just, you know, the number of people that you need picking stuff off of shelves is so reduced because the robot does most of the work by bringing the shelf to you. Yeah. So you don't need to fully replace people either is the thing. Like technology doesn't need to be good enough to fully replace a person, just good enough to make it so one person can do the work of 20 or whatever. Right, which and is exactly, yeah, what they've done at my... Because when I first started at the library, there were always two people out front because every, you had to hand check out everything. Mm-hmm. And I mean, and forget about when there were actual physical card catalogs, you know, yeah, how much work that was. I mean, that's... 
one small example, but yeah, I mean, you could really, you could replace the entire library as just an automated thing if you were a monster. The other thing, though, is there well, is well, and now you can you can get your audio books on your on your iPhone app or your whatever smartphone app. Yep, I helped my mom set up that. She wanted to get her audio books. Oh yeah, through the library. Yep, yep, yeah. That's a nice feature. Yeah, and then see, libraries do look forward like that. I think, I think the the thing that will always save a public thing like a library, and I think possibly a lot of service stuff, is there are people who don't like the automation. There are people who don't want to put their books through the automatic sorter. There are people who don't want to use a self check. They want a person to help them yeah but is that a demographic like age-based difference largely but not exclusively yep but i mean it's going to diminish over time yes it will and especially more as people get used to automation it will also diminish because then people like i uh am annoyed at the grocery stores that the self-checks have a limit on items where you can only do them under a certain amount i'm annoyed that i have to stand in line and wait for the person i uh i'm actually a dinosaur at the grocery store i like the person checkout because i think the self checkouts are poorly designed like yeah i feel like i need to wait three seconds after every scanned item because it needs to like recalibrate the weight to make sure I'm not stealing something. Yeah. The I mean, why can't it just like wait to the end or I don't know. It, it there's got to be a way to make that faster. I like going to the person because even if I have to wait for someone in front of me, unless they have a a big load of stuff, it's probably going to be faster to have the person there who can just scan it, scan my stuff. Unless I have like one item or something. Like if I only have like three things or less, it's probably faster to do the self checkout. Yeah, and I noticed something just the other day at the grocery store, and that is, they had the one I went to had I don't know ten to fifteen lanes to check out at in like four self check areas, mm-hmm. and they had two lanes with human operators open that both had lines, but they weren't having anybody else go hop on one of the many many empty stations. Like even like at peak shopping like grocery shopping time like around thanksgiving and stuff Uh i've never seen a grocery store that had all of its manual lines operated and i did notice yeah and i've noticed too that they normally have one person who's running around to all the different self-checks helping out the many many people who for some reason cannot figure out to not set a purse or bag or child on the weighted bench and not to just don't don't touch the weighted bench see yeah that's the other thing is like the self-checkout i feel like is so like it should be way better than it is that's <laughs> maybe just be able to you know what here's what you need for yourself oh God, now our design uh things to replace people's jobs you need uh so that you can uh roll your cart up to it it grabs the cart gently pulls out the items scans them and bags them nicely for you uh has you just swipe a thing and then, like, puts your bags back in your cart for you. Or what if it could just somehow read everything in your cart without you taking it out of the cart? Oh, yeah, there you go. Little RFID tags on it. Just do a zoop past and... Yeah. 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 That would work. That way, when you get your grocery cart, it already has bags and you put stuff in the bags as you shop. Oh. Yeah. See? I should be a capitalist. (laughs) (laughs) No, that would be that would be too dangerous. You are not allowed to be a capitalist. I'm putting my foot down because <laughs> I have sway over you like that. Apparently, <laughs> I respect your opinion. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's depressing that we turn to just how to automate things better. Although that is one thing, maybe maybe that is also something that says that automation is not going to be taking over is the extreme promise in lackluster implementation. Like, I was just reading an article yesterday about self-driving cars Mm -hmm. and about how wonderful and great they are unless it's heavy rain or snow or not on these roads that they've thoroughly scanned so that it's familiar with everything. Uh Also, if there are potholes, good luck. It will hit every single one of them. And, you know, yeah, 
they work good on well charted, well maintained roads in sunny weather. Yep. Which so, yeah, which is not a good lot of roads. <laughs> yeah, which means a self driving car around here we would be able to use for a week and a half. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's a dismal. I I disagree with that. But, okay, fine. You'd be, but well, it, but it would, would be like less than half the year. Yeah, it probably would be less than half the year, honestly. Especially if they're bad with construction, which they probably would be. You know, oh, the, God, what, yeah. what are the chances that they'd go straight into the construction Ooh. and not like take the detour? Yeah, I I think it'll require a large. In order for self-driving cars to really be a nationwide thing, it'll require a large infrastructural investment in just technology around roads, like building Wi-Fi networks on all the roads so that the cars can communicate, and sophisticated traffic control systems and traffic monitoring systems everywhere. But you know what? Even with the Which lack- would be a good public works project. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> With, but even with lackluster implementation or like you know stupid flubs, because people make these kind of flubs all the time. You know, like they didn't consider X, Y, or Z. Like you could probably find a million, uh, like example stories where some software project or new technology project totally messes up because they didn't account for something that like probably anyone could have told you. I hear technology for the blind because they don't ask blind people what they want. So it'll be somebody who can see, trying to think about what somebody who's blind wants, build this technology, and the blind people go, well, this is useless. Yeah, I believe that. But I think as, like, I think that that is a symptom of this being a relatively new industry still. Like, eventually people will get good enough at it that, um, that that won't be a problem anymore. Or, like, it may be a problem, but it'll be, like... A thing that people know like sort of like before there were standards in like how to raise livestock there were probably all kinds of dumb problems with livestock but eventually people had done it for long enough that they figured out the right way to do it and they made it sure that everyone else has to follow these rules for the right way to do it like i think the same thing will probably happen with technology eventually like yeah there will be stories of things that went bad but they will be like the weird bizarre ones like whoa this is a big problem that they didn't do this instead of like the norm where there's like yeah we know there's a whole bunch of bugs when we first go live with something and it takes 10 years to figure out how to do it right but we get there yeah it'll i think that it'll be the weird thing with when it doesn't work right the first time eventually yeah, which will also make it the scary thing when you're talking about self-driving cars. and Because oh, yeah. I, I don't want to be around for one of those not working. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that would be a fun system to just... It'd be fun to troubleshoot those, I think. So what do you think is the... Why do you think the cracked hosts and CPG Grey and just other folks on the internet will critique capitalism like or or do do uh an episode or a vlog or whatever about something that is clearly problems all associated with capitalism why do you think they say then that they support capitalism at the end of it or maybe the the weaker stance i am not a socialist yeah uh i think i think the i would i'd say it's twofold one, I would say, is exactly the I'm-not-a-socialist thing, the the worrying about red-baiting, especially with these people being um, somewhat public figures. I mean, you mm-hmm. know, they're not, like, giant celebrities, but they have their a decent-sized following. So I think in there, unfortunately, is a stigma attached to being a socialist or communist or even just far left that doesn't identify with any of that Mm -hmm. and i think the other thing is and i think this is true of even a lot of socialists uh sometimes uh especially like when i think of european social democracies or like uh francois Hollande, the president of france Mm -hmm. is that i think a lot way too many people buy into margaret thatcher's there is no other alternative Mm -hmm. like it's i i think that really 
paralyzes a lot of the socialist parties in Europe is I think they've really bought into the neoliberal ideas and that, you know, they're just trying to make it better. Yeah, capitalism is the way it is. There is no such thing. Yeah. No and, no alternative. There is no other thing. There all just is capitalism. Yeah, and it could even be, uh, for the European socialists, I mean, I might be being very unfair. It might just be, you know, decades of struggle with seeing no progress. It just has them, you know, disillusioned and depressed. Sure. Because um, that is depressing when you think about the 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 state and how the struggle has not really gone where we would like it to. You know, I think the other thing you mentioned red baiting, yeah. but I I think it's a new I I'm not even sure I would call it red baiting, but maybe we're talking about the same thing. I don't think it's that they're afraid that like Joe McCarthy's going to come around and lock them up or get them on a blacklist or something like that. I think it's that because of the Cold War and because of McCarthy and because of all of this history that we have, we instantly discredit socialism in this country. That yeah. it's it's an issue of credibility, and we we've developed a culture where you instantly lose your credibility if you decide decide that to call yourself a socialist, and so it's that. I think that's part of it, is they don't want to be taken as as instantly losing their credibility amongst that crowd. But I'm going to take it even one step further. I think that since the development of postmodernism, we have, especially on the left, on the right-hand side of the political spectrum, it is always and still is okay to say i know the right answer and that it and it is this on the left hand of the political spectrum since the development of postmodernism it's almost a sin to say i know what the right answer is it's almost always the correct or like politically correct or polite thing to say i don't know what the answer is like you know how cpg gray a- ends that episode or and where he says I don't know, uh, or or says in the episode I don't know what the right answer is. I don't have answers here. That's extremely acceptable. People are very open to someone that says I don't know. Yeah. People don't like it when, especially on the left, they don't like it when someone says I think I know the answer here. And any time you say, even if you don't say, um. I have the answer. If you say I am a socialist, it's too close to saying I know all of the right answers and have a predetermined answer to everything. Like that's what they think that all you do is sit around saying, "Well, that's that's capitalism's fault and that's capitalism's fault and I know the answer to everything and it's to be the Soviet Union or whatever." You know, like that I think is what people think when they hear socialist. And so they, any time they might be accused of being that, they want to let people know, no, I think things through for my own. You know, saying I'm not a socialist is, I think, a way of saying I think things through for my own. But I think it stems from this, this still, I, you know, really annoying... Um, conception of socialism that still hangs around or conception of what a socialist is. You know, it's not accurate. You know, obviously, Tony and I can tell you a socialist doesn't mean that we have these pre-described beliefs that we must cling to. You know, they think of socialism as as a dogmatic religion. I I actually thought Chairman Mao's Little Red Book had all the answers. I Yeah, right? God. (laughs) (laughs) But, so, it's... I, I think that's what part of it is, is saying if they were to come out and say, I'm a socialist, they would they think that they're ascribing attributes to themselves that socialism does not mean uh, and probably never did mean to anyone who is honest about what socialism means, but but certainly today does not mean that anymore. Yeah. Well, I also think, though, along with that, though, there is a changing tide with the stigmatism for socialism on the generational 
side in that it's it's about half of people in our generation are don't have a problem with socialism they view socialism more favorably than capitalism see that's i yep i i think there's also a age thing here and i think the the group like those couple of podcasts that we mentioned and a lot of like popular vloggers things like that i think like about 35 seems to kind of be this the sweet spot age for a lot of those folks Mm -hmm. um and i Uh, That is still, that's the tail end of Generation X, if you want to look at, like, generations. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is still a generation that was largely influenced by McCarthyism. They remember the Cold War. I was alive for the fall of the Berlin Wall, as were you, but I couldn't have told you, and I couldn't have told you where I was, like other people can. No, yeah. Well, I couldn't I, even have told you that it happened until much, much later, even though I was... Y- yeah. When was that, 80... No. 91. 91, so I, I was... I think, or maybe 89. I, I don't know. The, the wall came down one year. I think the wall came down in 89, yeah, and, then and then the Soviet, Soviet Union, Union disbanded in 91. Where, which I also couldn't have told you, and I was yeah. six at the time? Yeah, and I... Well, let's see. I was born in 84, so that would put Eight, me at... Seven. Seven? Yeah. Which, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's no way... I mean, the Soviet Union and the Berlin Wall, even though I was alive for both of those events, are events that I know as history. Yeah, They too. were not things that happened in, like, my politically conscious lifetime, essentially. So, yeah, the, like the, the, I think I learned about them. Probably not even in history class, because in history class, it was, like, too recent to be history. So right. I'm not exactly sure where I picked it up. Just kind of, like general like pop culture and folklore you hear about these things and then read about it on wikipedia yeah because it wasn't old enough to be history but i was too young to have learned it in uh or to to know anything about it when it happened yeah it's yeah i i think that sort of removed with the fall of the berlin wall may a lot of people think that or a lot of people then as i guess still now think that that somehow invariably proves that communism was wrong and Ronald Reagan through sheer will of telling someone to tear it down single-handedly defeated uh communism and Marx's ideals forever yeah um but I just yeah I also feel like for us younger generation that removed the cloud uh of the anti com because people then sort of moved beyond that, and communists were no longer the bad guys and left. Yep. I mean, because basically, if you name. if you're in your twenties now, you grew up where Marxism was not a country that we were at war with. Marxism was a set of ideas about and and that critique the world that we live in in very pertinent ways. If you are willing to entertain them, yeah. Uh, and that opens up a whole I, – I think that makes a much bigger opening there. You know, to to be someone who is on the side of a country that you're at war with is a completely different thing than to be someone who is willing to critique the system in which they live. You know, we're, we're willing to critique everything else, you know. every People write reviews about every little thing or, or you know, they'll – We'll debate over what the definition of marriage is in this country, for example. Yeah. But we largely don't have an open debate about uh, about capitalism as our economic system or what alternatives there could be. We might argue over how much we should regulate our capitalism, but that's basically the extent of the argument. Okay, so here's something that that may, reminded me of. So, see, we'll have to put this picture up or link to it. See this picture? Yeah. That is 37 high school students in Little Rock, Arkansas, who started a YDS chapter, a Young Democratic Socialists of America chapter. Yeah, I saw that. 37 high school students. That's crazy. That is how much less of a stigma there is, is that in a large... I guess I don't know how big Little Rock is. It's a decent-sized city in Arkansas, I think. I mean, we went to a pretty big high school... uh, and I remember I was part of the the GSA, the Gay Straight Alliance, when there was a lot of gay bashing going on, and we didn't have thirty seven people. Yeah, 
You know, we we actually did had an okay showing, but not thirty seven. We were probably like fifteen, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, and for fringe political, well, I don't want to think of it as fringe, but for as mainstream politics go, that's pretty fringe. That is insane and very inspiring to me. Yeah. Like, I, what I want to know is, okay, are, is there a Republicans and a Democrats group? Because, you know, most schools don't have, you know, anything like that either. But some do, I think. You know, like, young Republicans, young Democrats, or whatever. A lot yeah. of colleges have them. Yeah. But I want to know, do, do those groups exist at Little Rock, and how small are they? Because I bet they're smaller than 37. Yeah. You think they're going to... Uh, yeah. But that... I mean, that sort of thing, that, that helped. That makes me feel better when I we talk about you know the gloom and doom of the possible future. Yeah, yeah. If if I could do anything, you know, I'm sure that none of those uh, groups that um, we were talking about um, listen to us. But if they were ever to say someone who knew them listened to us, or somehow the we could have their ear for a very short period of time, I would the thing that I would invite those groups to do is to look at what socialism means now look you know read up or or listen to what a modern marxist like like david harvey or rick wolf or yeah i probably don't want to start with zizek he's really fun but (laughs) he's probably not a starter but you know i would say look into what modern socialists and modern marxists believe now and I bet you'll find that you have a decent amount of agreement with them, and you might not feel comfortable calling yourself a Marxist or a socialist after listening to that. But I think that you will acknowledge that there is an argument there, and that you won't feel the need to immediately dismiss it or immediately make the claim that you are certainly not one of those. Yeah. Yeah. I... Yeah, I often I wish we could get on those podcasts just because so often when they're talking about that sort of stuff, I just want to yell through the headphones somehow back into the past and be like, "No, you're forgetting this." <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We could write in or something. Yeah, I'm sure they'll get right on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow. uh, depends on how much. Yeah, I mean, some people just write you off right away, but who knows. Yeah, if anywhere it says Marxist or socialist, I'm just going to guess it's going to get written off pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's that's my rant for that topic. Did, did you want to say anything else about it? No, I think we hit everything. Okay, let's, let's call this one a, a done episode, then. A done episode. You're a done episode. Done, I tell you. This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Tony Schmidt and Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com, where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.